Hello and welcome to Checking the Vitals, a podcast powered by Specialty Care. I'm Todd Schlosser and today our guest is Dr. Michael Furstenberg, the Chief of Cardiothoracic and Vascular Surgery at the Medical Center of Aurora in Colorado. In this conversation, we discuss how a gap year spent working at the Cleveland Clinic helped him decide to focus in cardiac surgery as a specialty, how the research he was involved in early in his career laid the groundwork for some amazing innovations, and how COVID-19 will impact innovations as we move forward. Enjoy the conversation. Uh, so, Michael, first off, thanks, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate you taking the time early this morning to have this conversation. Uh, and I really like to start off the podcast the same way every time, and that is simply to ask, what is it that made you want to pursue a career in healthcare in general? Yeah. So the short answer is actually, I've always wanted to be a physician. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as far back as I can remember, I've always wanted to be a doctor. And over the years, throughout my youth and adolescence, that's when my interests really started to get honed into the direction that I ultimately chose, and that is cardiac surgery. Yeah. W were there any physicians in the family or mentors at church or in community that led you that way? Or were you just dead set on being a physician from a young age? I was, I was dead set on it, which was really sort of interesting because uh, part of my career, I did some of my training and ultimately worked at uh, the Ohio State University. Yeah. And I was on the, uh, the medical school admissions committee over there. And we, we always kind of talked about what motivated you know, students to go into medicine. And a lot of times they did have mentors or family members or some life yes. event that somehow exposed them and sort of started that spark. But as long as I can remember, you know, something I always wanted to do, there was nobody in the family, uh, nobody even close to being in, in healthcare. Oh, wow. Um, you know, I can't remember, you know, short of an emergency room visit here and there as a sure. child. I, you know, I don't remember anything really being that, that pivotal, uh, pivotal moment where I just said, this is what I want to do. Uh, it wasn't until kind of much later on as I got a little older that I start really, as I mentioned, focusing on, on a specific area of medicine and specialty. Yeah. So at a young age, you wanted to go into medicine. You knew that going in. Uh, and then, of course, you go to college. And I, I'm assuming you stayed in Ohio, correct? Or no, it was Chicago. Yeah, actually. Yeah. Correct. So while uh, my family, and in fact, my mom still lives in the house that I grew up in, just outside oh, wow. of Cleveland, uh, you know, we kind of stayed on the east side of Cleveland. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to the University of Chicago for my undergrad. Yeah. And then uh, after that, came back. And uh, actually somewhat interesting because, like I said, you know, I knew I was interested in medicine. And around, you know, when I was in undergrad, you know, I had gotten interested in rowing crew and doing yeah triathlons. And so I was very into cardiovascular physiology, uh, you know, particularly of endurance sports and sure. you know, stuff. And uh, one of the summers towards the end of my college experience, uh, my father, who worked with uh, a company that did some medical supply stuff to the Cleveland Clinic, actually got me some part-time work in the uh, Department of Cardiology there and specifically with electrophysiology. So studying kind of the electrical system of the heart. Right. And, uh, and that was just fascinating. I really sort of loved, you know, and that was sort of like, okay, so now I, I know I wanted to do something with the heart. And as I got right. more experience with that, you know, and we were doing some really exciting, innovative uh, stuff computer wise and medical wise. It was a very exciting time in that field, which was really starting to just take off. And I almost started pursuing that. Was this in between um, undergrad and med school or was it in between med school and residency? Okay. So around, around what time was it, you know, that you were uh, working at the Cleveland clinic at this, I'm, I'm assuming somewhat of a research capacity. Yeah. And it, and it was interesting. So let me kind of dial back the years here. So it was around <laughs> 19, I think it was about 1990. Okay. And, and, uh, and, and in fact, you know, the, the stuff that we were working on and the opportunity that I had was, was really very exciting and actually for a variety of reasons, turned that into what we call a gap year. And that yes. is taking time between undergrad and medical school and using that time, you know, somewhat, you know, productively, yeah. and, you know, not, you know, so I was, as I mentioned, even though I was kind of hired as a computer programmer analyst, 
to do some network development stuff. And this was just taking off and, you know, playing around with this thing called, you know, the World Wide Web. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, the, and we were doing a lot of very innovative stuff with devices for treating cardiac arrhythmias. And some of the stuff was just coming out. And it was sure. really exciting time. And kind of putting the things together to do some interesting research, like, you know, coming up with some databases and computer development product, projects that really helped usher in a lot of innovation at that time. And so it was very exciting, which is why I ended up taking that time before going on to medical school. Yeah, I think of that era, the sort of early to mid 90s as sort of the end of the first wage of the electric era and then the starting of the Internet era, which I think we're sort of in. And I, I'd imagine there was a lot of innovation happening at that time in medical devices and all of that stuff that you sort of got to see in a weird sort of gap year in between undergrad and med school. So was when you went to the Cleveland Clinic to do this job, were you already thinking you wanted to focus on the heart? Because this is, this is pre-med school and you don't have to decide to focus until well after that. So, Right. And, and yes. So at that point, I knew I wanted to do something heart related. Okay. Uh, and, you know, and like I said, you know, we were doing a tremendous amount of really exciting, innovative stuff there. Uh, and, you know, this was a lot when, you know, computers and computer networks and all the software tools also were really kind of coming together. Yeah. Uh, you know, Gateway was at its prime even before, <laughs> you know, you know, so we had, you know, boxes of all the cows around, you know, I may be dating, I'm dating myself, obviously. And <laughs> um, unfortunately, I was working with people that really had the vision and, uh, and we had access to the resources to really do, you know, some exciting uh, projects. And not only that, but, you know, the Cleveland Clinic, as I think most people know, really is, um, you know, one of the, the leaders in a lot of areas. And we were, and this was just the tremendous amount of stuff that was going on in all the disciplines it was really just, it was like being a kid in a candy store. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. You, know, you, you couldn't help but stumble over something really exciting that everybody was doing. Yeah. And you know, even looking back now, you know, several decades, you know, the stuff was really you know, amazing. And so it was, it was a very exciting time for me. And, and that's when I knew that I wanted to do, you know, something cardiovascular related. And I was kind of bouncing all over the place doing my projects and getting exposed to everything. But uh, the, the thing that kind of tipped it off is that uh, I met a couple. So she was, she was a nurse at the time and mm -hmm. her husband was a cardiac surgeon at uh, actually okay. one of the other hospitals. He was not working at the Cleveland Clinic. <laughs> And okay. you know, they had um, become friends with both of them and sure. started using that time to get a little bit, interestingly, a little bit more exposure to what he was doing, um, combined with, you know, being in the operating room at the Cleveland Clinic, which is like being in mission control, you know, at, during yeah, the Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I just remember, I don't remember the exact moment, you know, the exact day, but I just remember saying, you know, this is what I want to do. Yeah, this is where I'm heading. Yeah. This is really, you know, and we sort of had this kind of joke, you know, that there's there's two types of, of surgeons. There's cardiac surgeons and then there's doctors who want to be cardiac. <laughs> I've heard a similar joke from a neurophysiologist, but the punchline's different. <laughs> so you end your gap year and you decide to leave the Cleveland Clinic and you go into uh, what I assume is just med school, correct? Right. Yeah. And you do your uh, stint in med school. And where did you end up for your residency? So uh, actually, so medical school was at Case Western Reserve University, which okay. is not given at all. It's literally, you know, across the street. You could probably stand on the roof of the clinic or Case Western and drive a golf ball, you know, <laughs> provided you got enough bounce and roll. I mean, there, it's probably about a mile or two apart. Okay. And, uh, and the hospitals are obviously, you know, quite competitive. Sure. And it's sort of funny because, you know, like a lot of times, you know, people, they enter medical school and they want to do primary care. They want to orthopedics you know my interest was a little bit more hyper focused and uh, and right. my friend always used to tease me about it uh, <laughs> but and, and I, I really enjoyed medical school you know it's it was it's such an exciting learning process and uh, and the curriculum and the people and the classmates were were wonderful and, and it was a lot of fun yeah uh, you know I didn't mind you know the study you know the learning learning new things and then the way that their curriculum was structured is that you really had the opportunity to sort of put it all together very quickly and then apply it. So you really could say, you know, you learned something in the lab or you learned something 
you know, in, in the classroom. And then very quickly, you have the opportunity to, to try to use that uh, and, and see why you're learning things. Yeah. As opposed to like college when you learn quantum mechanics and you're like, you know, what am I using this for? And you never get the practical application of it. Right. Yeah. And, um, and so as a function of that, I was able to really start, you know, kind of honing down things a little bit more. And then ultimately did my residency in Cleveland at the university program. So it was the affiliate program uh, where I was able to then, you know, stay at home. Um, yeah. And uh, ultimately, you know, continue on with my training. And, uh, you know, the thing with cardiac surgery is that the, the pathway is very long. And it so is. my post-medical school graduation, you know, so now we're looking at 1996. I'm starting my resident, actually right. I'm starting my residency. And uh, it's five years of general surgery. And then in the middle of that five years, uh, in part because I wanted to do a specialty, meaning cardiac, mm -hmm. cardioplastic, that I took two years off to do research, which so is something that, yeah, so which is something that most people do. And through my, my contacts, I was able to actually go back to the Cleveland Clinic in the Department of Cardiology and uh, do some very, again, tremendously exciting imaging research and non-invasive physiology. And it was a really, it was, it was a very exciting time again, you know, because of some opportunities, some wonderful mentors, some great people yeah. really kind of uh, helped spark uh, my interest and, and motivate me to, I mean, I, I never wanted to go home. We were doing all kinds <laughs> of fun stuff. We were involved, you know, this was just at the time that NASA was launching the International Space Station and that was getting up and running. And we had a part of my salary came from a grant that was looking at doing imaging and imaging research in the International Space Station and looking at the effects of zero gravity and actually working on ultimately getting an ultrasound machine up in space, not only for research purposes, but also for diagnostic reasons. And we were sort of doing a lot of the, the research that, you know, was related to that. So you know, now I'm watching, you know, For All Mankind on Apple TV, which is, if I can plug it, I think it's a great show. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and I can kind of relate to that because, you know, we were, you know, we were kind of part of, you know, that little corner of what was going on in, in space development. And, it, and it's really very exciting and working with brilliant people. That, uh, yeah, that's, that's awesome. I, I would assume that like it, that would, those would be NASA doctors doing that and that they would want to keep all that in house. So I had no idea they didn't do it all themselves, that they actually opened that up to uh, people like you. That's awesome. Yeah. So we had, we had, a uh, pretty substantial, so my mentor, you know, who still is, you know, a very dear friend, I went to his wedding a few years ago in Norway, <laughs> uh, you know, he, what, he was just brilliant, really, you know, he had a, uh, you know, he had studied, you know, at, at Harvard and, and had undergraduate degrees in mathematics and was right. phenomenally smart and really understood, you know, the stuff. And we were doing very exciting imaging research and you know when you see ultrasounds even card you know so we were doing cardiac ultrasound you see all these pretty colors you know we were really starting to understand what those colors mean sure. and you know there was a lot of very um, new things that were going on at the cleveland clinic at the time that we were able to apply all this imaging technology for uh that again you know has subsequently you know that laid the foundation of you know what is going on now, so you know when you talk about like in medicine, you know where we are now has come from standing on the shoulders of giants. Yeah, uh, and it, and it really is true. But you know to be able to kind of walk around and, and play in the field while you see all these giants running around was, was really uh, uh, you know very uh, exciting and motivating. Yeah, I'm and, sure. You know, and particularly since a lot of the stuff that we were doing. Uh, translated into my interest in cardiac surgery. We were doing experiments in the operating room, you know, some very sophisticated stuff. And in fact, you know, a lot of the papers that we wrote back then uh, really are the, the cornerstone for some of the things that are going on now, which is always kind of fun. It's a little bit of a game that I play with some of my colleagues. We'll sit in a conference and, you know, somebody will talk about something and I'll be like, Oh yeah, I wrote a paper on that twenty years ago. <laughs> you know, not 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 to toot my horn, but it, it's kind of yeah, it's yeah, kind yeah. Of something. Or you know, I had a good friend of mine back in Cleveland that I worked with, and and he he would always turn to me and just the opposite. He says, "You probably wrote a paper on that." And then I pick up my phone and I would do a quick Google search, and I would show you know, sort of like you know, yeah, yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> 
I bet they love and hate that at the same time. <laughs> yeah, it was, it, was it, it, it depends, you know, it was kind of a fun game and, you know, but you gotta, you gotta temper that a little bit because you didn't want people to think that you were too egotistical, but it, you know, right. it's kind of, it has to kind of match the persona of what we do a little bit. You got to have to play the opposite. Yeah. I'd imagine to be able to take the risks that you guys take every day in the operating room, you have to have some of that built into your personality. And I mean that like in a good way. I mean, like we need people who can take those kind of risks and have that. Cause I'd imagine a lot of that comes back to confidence. Uh, and you know, so does, <laughs> so does sort of playing that game with your friends. I think it sort of comes back to confidence. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and a lot of it also is a function of the the training and how long it is. Uh, that oh, I guess that's true. We yeah. get used to, you know, doing more, you know, each step along the way. And and so it's not like you just kind of do it the first time. And so it is something that the the confidence, you know, just kind of comes from experience. It, it's almost, you know, like, you know, we sort of joke, it's like, you know, it's like falling off a bicycle type thing. And, you know, it does take a lot of practice and it does get to the point where, you know, now all of a sudden, you know, you just jump on a bicycle and you go do it. Uh, it is yeah. something that, you know, and that's why it takes, you know, it, you know, 12, you know, 10, 12, 15 years of training after medical school, you know, to, to do some of the things that we do. Um, yeah. And, uh, and, and trust me, you know, you know, I, I kind of, you know, we have a lot of jokes in the operating room that, uh, more and more it's uh it's the older generation that that picks up on them you know you know where you're sitting there you're doing something and you know you're like you find something a little bit more complicated or problematic than what you expected and you kind of turn to somebody and say i think we need a bigger boat you know <laughs> and and everybody you know everybody looks around like what is he talking about and then there's always one person that understands the reference or yeah you know, so, you know i, I I picked the wrong week to stop sniffing glue. You know, yeah. <laughs> some of these things that uh, some people get, you know, more and more people are not getting because a lot of that cultural stuff from, you know, that time period, it, you know, seems to get lost, but it uh, helps, you know, trust me every day, you know, there's a point in the case where, you know, we kind of like put, it's like a, working on a car's engine where you kind of put everything back together and you start, you know, you turn the ignition off. And you know, I just always say, God, I hope this works. Yeah. Not to jump ahead the timeline that we're sort of talking about here, but you are doing heart surgery where I assume some of the time uh, the heart is stopped and you have sort of a, a perfusionist in the room kind of keeping their blood circulating and their blood oxygenated. And then I'd imagine there's a great bit of uh, anxiousness uh, when it's time to restart that heart, uh, you know, because at that point it, it really is the test of is what I have done correct. And I can't think of a higher stakes test than to stop someone's heart and then to restart it. Yeah. I mean, you know, fundamentally it's, you know, I guess there's a couple ways of working on it, but, you know, talking about it, but it's sort of like working on an airplane's engine while yeah. a plane's flight, you yeah. know, where, you know, we, while there are certain things that we can do with the heart still beating fundamentally, you know, we have to stop the heart. We have to open it up. We have to get inside, you know, and we have to, or we have to work on the structures on the surface of it which are, are very small, not much more than a couple of millimeters. And, and yes, we have, you know, we have to stop it and work on it for a period of time. And during that time period, you know, as you mentioned, you know, we work with a lot of people in the room and one member uh, is the perfusionist, the person that runs the heart lung machine, right. which essentially is a machine that pumps blood throughout the body, uh, you know, to keep the brain alive uh, and to keep the rest of everything alive. And then we also remember the heart fundamentally is a muscle and mm -hmm. it needs energy. It needs oxygen. It needs blood. And even when it's stopped, you have to keep that muscle alive. And so we have a variety of techniques where we have to keep everything, you know, either not moving and alive or else we're going to have some problems. And yeah. so fortunately, again, you know, when you talk, again, talking about all the history and standing on the shoulders of giants over the years, you know, there's been, you know, decades of development in, in these technologies and these tools, both, you know, mechanical tools like, you know, some of the heart lung machines and the pumps that we use and all the different components that go into that, as well as, you know, some of the medications and other therapies that we have to do this, you know, safer. When I talk to patients, I tell them it's like flying a 747, you know, from, from Newark to Tokyo. It, uh, you know, a couple months ago was something that was done every day. Yeah. And, and it was done every day. And yeah, there's a couple bumps in the road and more often than not, then it, 
you know, usually get there safely, uh, but it's a tremendously sophisticated and complex process that really relies on the, the expertise of so many people of which, yeah. you know, I mean, yeah, you know, I think, you know, cardiac surgery is like, as a surgeon, I feel like I'm the conductor in an orchestra. Absolutely. And, you know, there's, you're, you've got a whole room full of people that are playing instruments and, you know, and each one has their own expertise and, you know, years, if not decades, and some of it much more than I, in, in doing it, whether it's the anesthesiologist or the perfusionist or the people helping. And, you know, when an operation is going well and everybody's firing on all four cylinders and things are in sync, it really does sound like a, you know, a beautiful orchestra. Uh, and when it's not, it sounds like an orchestra out of tune. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you, you painfully get through the, the piece, you know, so that it, it sounds pretty, you know, it sounds something, but it's, there's, there's up days and down days. I'm sure that's true. And to sort of beat a tortured metaphor, I'd imagine that going in to every surgery is like sight reading a new piece with your orchestra there because, and I know you're very well trained and so are the people in the room and all of you guys have years and years of both school and on work experience, but every patient is a little bit different. Every patient has different complications that you simply don't know going in because of limitations in technology or, you know, the, the pre-screening things that you guys do. And I realize that there's, and correct me if I'm wrong, there's probably been a lot of innovation in that. So you're not going in as blind as you used to be, but I'd imagine that there's a lot of uh, anxiousness around that going in for every patient. Oh yeah. And, and so, you know, more and more, we you know depend on all these. For example, all these imaging modalities. Yeah. As I mentioned, you know, early in my career, I did a lot of research in, in ultrasound, and we were doing things with you know cardiac MRI and cardiac CT scans and, right. and catheterizations. And so now we have all these different imaging tools that we can use. As I mentioned, you know, MRI, CAT scan, ultrasound, cardiac catheterization. You know, where we can get all these. Uh, either static or real-time dynamic pictures. And, you know, now people are getting into 3D printing, you know, looking at the structures and being able to hold real models in your hand and being able to just say, okay, this is, this is what we think the problem is mm -hmm. and what's not working. And then these are the, the things that we can do. These are the tools that we have to then try to fix that. Um, but, you know, the real challenge is, is that you know, it's not just working on a car's engine, but it's working on an engine of a car that, you know, maybe 40, 50, 80, 90 years old. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, the rest of the parts don't always work very well and have been kind of beat up over the years. And so, you know, more so we're dealing with the challenges of taking care of patients with, with bad diabetes, bad lung disease. Uh, you know, sort of comorbidities. Cool all the comorbidities yeah. and how, you know, for example, you know, we're learning, you know, where does COVID play into all this? Yeah. And, uh, and how do we take care of patients that need heart surgery that are infected with COVID or, you know, recovering? And that's something that we're, we're learning much like you know, we learned how to take care of patients with HIV years ago. Yeah. Uh, and not to go off on a tangent on COVID, but uh, I was surprised to learn what exactly the definition of elective surgery was during all of this. Because there are things that I thought w could not be elective that were being put off because they were deemed elective surgery. So like, uh, and I know there are some surgeries that like, you know, cardiac or cardiothoracic surgeries that are not elective. But uh, I'd imagine that there have been a lot of surgeries that were put off during this time. Oh, yeah. Um, and as we're coming out of it, you know, I'm, 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 sh I'm sure it's ramping back up at this point, although uh, I'm not 100 percent sure what it's like in Colorado where you are, but. I know some places are starting to open up and elective surgeries are starting to happen again, but is that something that you guys dealt with? Dramatically in, in kind of both ends of the spectrum, you know, sure. and you know, maybe part of this whole exchange between you and I, you know, the public service message in this is that, you know, if you have heart disease, you really don't wait, you know, to get that taken care of. Right. Uh, you know, you need to have it addressed sooner rather than later. You know, that, that chest pain that you're having you know, walking up a flight of stairs or, you know, going to the grocery store or exercising, you know, that is your heart being deprived of, of blood flow and oxygen. And over enough time, that is, that is potentially lethal. That yeah. causes damage. The shortness of breath that you get uh, doing any type, you know, even just walking out to get the mail, that is a sign that your body is not getting enough oxygen. And over time, that leads to damage. And, and if you get to the point where, 
you're getting dizzy, you're passing out, you're having chest pain or shortness of breath with minimal activity, you've got a bad problem. And part of that is we can't always fix it, you know. Uh, although we can, you know, maybe fix the, what's causing it, whether it's a valve that's not working or a, uh, a blocked artery or an infection, we can't always undo the damage that's been done. Right. And, and as your heart muscle starts getting injured, like any other muscle, it doesn't it doesn't always recover. And so putting things off, which is what we saw, and we're still seeing that, is that people would sit at home and they'd be having heart attacks at home and rather than getting treated right away, you know, we have this, you know, much like I know you work with, you know, neurologists and neurosurgeons, yeah. you know, but it's the, it's the same thing in our world. If you're having a stroke, if you're having a heart attack, the longer you wait in getting it taken care of, the more damage gets done. And, uh, and by the time you do come to the hospital, you're, you can be in much worse shape than if you come early on. And there was a, uh, fascinating if not somewhat tragic paper that came out of everything that was going on in new york so yeah. there's a problem that we deal with it's called an aortic dissection the aorta is the main blood vessel that comes off the artery of the heart and an aortic dissection is where it starts to to tear or rip and it can rupture and you can die it's actually what uh what john ritter from three's company ultimately died yeah of. controversy surrounding that yeah i remember that and and it's a a surgical emergency. You know, if you come to the emergency room, they diagnose an aortic dissection. You go immediately to the operating room. You know, you don't stop and you know pass go. Right. <laughs> and uh, when they looked statistically at New York, you know, they were averaging. I think I don't remember. You know, all the heart surgery programs in New York got together and wrote a paper on this. They were averaging. I think it was maybe fifteen of these a week in New York City last year right. during you know their big COVID you know, blast, which fortunately is coming down, yeah. they were doing maybe three or four a week, if I remember correctly. But the point is that there was this like 75% drop in the number of these that were coming to the hospital. And, you know, the disease just didn't go away, it, you know, and you can say, yeah. well, maybe people weren't doing things that prompted them to get it. But fundamentally, the message coincided with some of the other data that people were seeing that is people are just dying at home. Yeah. You know? And, and we saw a lot of that. And, and getting people in and overcoming the fear, the hype has been a real challenge because people just don't want to come to the hospital. Yeah. And, you know, they're ignoring, you know, some pretty dramatic and potentially life-threatening problems. Yeah. And I can imagine that could be life-threatening. You don't want to do that. If you have any issue like this, oh, yeah. please go. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we had a guy, he had a really bad infection of one of his heart valves, you know, and it was actually kind of a sad story. You know, he ended up getting... Uh, a splinter in his finger. It all started with a splinter wow. that got infected, and it just was smoldering for for six months. You know, and it was funny because it would be something like you know something you and I would do the same thing. We'd be like, oh, you know, just soak it in hot water, try to take <laughs> it out with it. You know, all the things that guys yeah. do. Yeah. And um, and it just was just never got better. And for you know reason, and he had had actually previous heart surgery, which may have kind of helped uh, or made it worse. But, uh, you know, he got an infection of one of his heart valves and it took us a while to convince him to come into the hospital. And, um, and while his surgery was, was difficult enough as it was because he had previous heart surgery, right. uh, he had a real rough course of it because of just waiting so long to get it taken care of. Yeah. I mean, he's doing okay now, uh, but it was a real rough go for him. Yeah. And, uh, and we see that, you know, people, you know, you know, again, it's it's like, you know, fixing, I tell people it's like the brakes in your car. You know, you can go in, if you if you get it taken care of early, then it's pretty cheap. You get your pads replaced in and yeah. out pretty quickly. If you put it off too long, it gets a lot more expensive. And in, you know, cardiovascular disease and cardiology and heart surgery, that expense is not only, you know, the dollars, but it's it's the risk and, and the complexity and sometimes the damage that's done to your body. So yeah. don't wait. Absolutely. So shifting gears a little bit, um, and I realize you've been um, practicing for a, a good number of years, um, you know, to the point where people are just now starting not to understand all the references in the OR. So what innovations have you seen change over the course of, uh, you know, your career actually in the OR? Yeah. So the, I think the interesting thing is that we're, we're sort of one of the few 
spec, you know, the few jobs or areas that we do whatever we can to put ourselves out of business. And, uh, <laughs> and, and I think more and more, for better or for worse, we're sort of succeeding. Uh, you know, on one side, our problems are getting harder and harder, but, you know, some of the real innovation in catheter-related therapies, I was teasing one of my cardiology colleagues, you know, we tease each other back and forth, and yeah. he was teasing me about something, and I don't remember what it was, and I sort of went back to him, I said, well, you know, all these exciting things that you're doing in the cath lab that we sometimes partner together on, you know, the they were all perfected in the operating room before somebody put it on a catheter to do in the cath lab, and so a lot of the exciting work that we're doing with catheter-based replacement of heart valves. Uh, my particular area of interest is also in uh, artificial heart-lung support. Uh, one of the things that has been a real challenge during, again, with COVID, much like we saw with H1N1 flu in 2009, yeah. was these people really come in very sick with very bad, complex uh, pneumonias and supporting them on artificial heart-lung machines for weeks on end. Uh, that's something that's a real interest of mine, and and I've done a lot of you know research and writing and you know several textbooks and speaking all over the world, which has been really, again, exciting for me because it's been an opportunity where I can meet a lot of wonderful people, make some great friends all over the world, and probably the the biggest for me, you know, despite you know the dealing with the loss of life that comes from COVID, is the loss of being able to interact with with friends that. Uh, that have got sick. Some of them have died. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, fortunately I've stayed healthy, uh, or at least physically, I don't know, mentally healthy. <laughs> yeah. But uh, being able to do all that stuff has really been a wonderful opportunity, but it's also, you know, the tragedy that's come from it has also sparked other areas of research uh, and, and, and things that have really, you know, kind of starting to bring me into the next phase or chapter of my life, which you know, trying to focus in on those things as well. Yeah, absolutely. So w when you're referring to those like heart and lung machines, are you, are you actually referring to uh, an actual like perfusion machine or more like the ECMO? Uh, the machines? ECMO, sir, the ECMO. So, yeah. uh, so for, for people that hopefully are listening that may not be familiar with that, as I mentioned, you know, to do heart surgery, we have to stop the heart and we have to pump blood through the body. And right. while and, uh, that sounds kind of simple, it, it's actually a very complex interaction between human and machine. And something that people have been working on for decades, you know, you, you see, you know, what, you know, Life magazine covers from the 60s about yeah. heart, heart lung, you know, machines and heart pumps that we're still now working on, you know, 40, 50, 60 years later. And, you know, the concept of, you know, people that have very advanced pneumonias or very advanced heart disease, where you hope that they get better with your treatments, you still have to support them, you know, while they're recovering. Uh, and to do that, you know, essentially these ECMO, as you mentioned, uh, is a way of draining the blood out of the body, uh, pumping oxygen into the blood. So you have oxygenated blood and nutrients right. that are in blood, what makes blood red. And so you take the blue blood out, which is, you know, it's that color because it's filled with carbon dioxide. You're able to filter out the carbon dioxide and then you put in the oxygen, the nutrients, which makes it red. And then you actively pump it back into the body so that even if the lungs are not working at all or the heart is not working, you can still circulate, you know, blood throughout the body to keep to keep the patient alive. Absolutely. And uh, that's something that we've been doing quite a bit of, of work on more recently with the challenge of some of these really sick COVID patients. There's a, uh, I don't know his name offhand, although I'd recognize it or we joke, I'd pick it out of a list of four, you know, which is probably <laughs> for a test. Uh, you know, a famous actor that is being, you know, that was supported on this and his wife was, you know, through, I think it was Instagram or some type of social media, you know, communicating with actually with friends of mine, you know, as he was going through this horrible uh, endeavor. And it sounds like he's making progress, but he still has a long ways to go. And we've yeah. seen some really dramatic recoveries, you know, even in our small little hospital with that. Yeah. Now I've heard that, um, you know, ECMO machines or ECMO support is sort of the last line of defense against COVID. You need, not everyone needs it. I mean, it's, it really is the, the most dire of cases that need to go on it because they need their body needs that extra support. Uh, so it's great that that technology has improved to a point where it can be used that way. Uh, and I'm super interested in what innovations will come because of COVID. So do you have any thoughts around uh, with everything that the, ho the hospital system uh, and doctors and patients have had to deal with because of this, where do you see sort of innovation going post COVID? 
Yeah, so I think there's a couple of things, or big things that are coming. One is how we do medical research. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, that, that's a huge topic in itself, and I don't think we have really time to go into it, but you see the controversies played out in the, the, the news, for better or for worse, about, you know, uh, you know, hydroxychloroquine, for example, yeah. great drug, horrible drug, you know, yes, no, back and forth. Yeah. Some of the drugs like, you know, remdesivir, you know, and it's introducing, you know, people to the concepts of how we even develop, not just develop and design vaccines, but how we get from, from bench, as we say, bench top to bedside. Uh, and, you know, those types of things, you know, the whole models of how we do that, the time frame, you know, has really been changed dramatically because of this. Uh, you know, if you look at, you know, I mean, it's sort of amazing that you know, within just a few months, you know, we're already trialing the early trials of vaccines for this. I mean, we've been working on a vaccine for HIV for, what, 30 years now. Yeah. Uh, you know, some of the more common, you know, flu, you know, yes, there's vaccines, but, you know, there's a lot of things we just haven't cured and or the vaccines are not 100 percent effective. And yet, you know, we're pushing, you know, frontiers you know, really to the limit and, and how we do science and how we report it and how we peer review it. I think that's another thing. Uh, the other aspect of it is, I think some of the humanitarian things that have come from this, that uh, I think, you know, not just, you know, my colleagues, you know, when I look at some of the nurses and this, you know, the, the tremendous commitment that, you know, that they've made to taking care of some of these patients. I mean, this is sort of really the first time, you know, I, I was, very early on in my medical career when HIV was really starting to yeah. take off. And, and I had friends of mine that, uh, you know, teachers in medical school that were, for example, in San Francisco when this was blossoming and nobody really knew what it was. I right. mean, we sort of have a better idea in retrospect and, and, and those types of things. But, you know, here we are now at a pandemic where people are scared. You know, you don't know how to prevent it. You know, remember, you know, there is still a pretty significant percentage of people that if they get infected, they die. Yeah. And, you know, particularly the nursing staff, you know, and, and those of us that are on the front lines dealing with it, it's, there's a lot of uncertainty. And, and I think, you know, some of the, the recognition of that and the challenges that dealing with, you know, a healthcare system and you see, you know, not just the huge sacrifice of some of you know, our nursing colleagues and some of the other, you know, physicians that I work with that uh, really on the front lines. But then you also see, you know, some of the administrative aspects and, you know, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. Sure. Uh, There's <laughs> a lot to unpack there. That are, that are kind of sensitive and politically charged, which I yeah. don't want to get into, but it, it really changes the face of medicine. And, uh, you know, kind of, a, again, a, a pitch to a project that I'm working on, uh, if I can. Absolutely. Uh, and you may edit it out. I mean, this is... Uh, this is actually a prototype of, of an N95 mask. I mean, the amount of science and technology that is behind this, and, and this didn't exist a month ago. Uh, you know, there's a company wow. that, I'm, that I'm partnering with out in San Francisco, uh, where essentially they were, they were recognized, they recognized early on, they were doing battery powered, you know, automotive technology and all of their engineers said, you know, something's going on here. We want to turn our attention to some humanitarian stuff yeah. and come up with, you know, the real challenge I think most people know is access to appropriate masks and technology. And you can see this kind of plastic and there's a filter. This is, this is meant, this, so this is the equivalent of, of an N95 mask. We don't have true N N95 approval, just yet, it's going to be submitted shortly. Yeah. But what's really exciting about this is that it's reusable, and and it's reusable in and it can be cleaned in a way that this can be readily manufactured and distributed in across the world in in third world countries and and, and affordable for places like you know India, China, South America, Africa, where for a fraction of the, what we're paying right now for N95 masks. So you use N95, yeah. Yeah, that everybody needs. You know, now, you know, you've got something that, that people can use all over the world. And, 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 you know, and part of our mission is a humanitarian aspect of it. I've got a friend of mine that runs a humanitarian organization where they develop uh, heart, you know, heart surgery programs, particularly pediatric child, 
heart surgery programs all over the world. And, you know, the company has recognized that, you know, if we're really going to try to do some good. Uh, and I don't know if I can do shout outs, but you know, sure. is, is called BioAid. Uh, mm -hmm. And they're based in San Francisco. And they, you know, recently established a, a partnership with a friend of mine, Bill Novick, and his what's called Cardiac Alliance, where they do pediatric heart surgery all over the world in developed programs. And the, and the two organizations have come together in part because of COVID to, you know, supply masks to support his mission so that he can continue to go into, you know, he's got, I think, an upcoming trip to, to Libya. Uh, wow. And, uh, you know, so that he and his team can go there safely and, and continue on with their mission. And I've been kind of talking with him about, you know, my birthday's in July and his upcoming trip is, I think, in Benghazi. And I'd be like, hey, I, I'd love to spend my birthday, you know, on the, on the beach in the Mediterranean. You know, yeah. what happens, it's in Benghazi, but, you know. Uh, you know <laughs> Still qualifies as Mediterranean. Exactly. I would, I, you know, I would go tomorrow, you know. Yeah. So, you know, that, that's one of the real, as tragic as, as COVID has been to every aspect yeah. of human life, it has really then brought out some of the good that people are doing. I mean, talking with the people at BioAid um, and what they're doing and partnering them with, you know, somebody like Bill and his Cardiac Alliance and getting these people together uh, to really raise the humanitarian work, you know, the next level. I mean, you know, being in Colorado, uh, you know, there's all these kind of small little companies that make, you know, outdoor gear. You know, I think everybody's familiar with you yeah. know, Patagonia and North Face. Absolutely. But, you know, there's all sorts of similar places out there, uh, you know, all over Colorado that make puffer jackets and vests and all kinds of stuff. And one of the things that we saw was, you know, as their sales kind of went down and people were being furloughed and people, you know, uh, they they turned their inventory and their machinery into making masks yeah. and into making PPE. And th again, not necessarily as a, you know, as an opportunity for business or profit, but more so, you know, we, uh, uh, you know, to do some good. You know, I was amazed that, uh, and, and I've got pictures of it, but I, we can't show them now, but I was amazed, you know, I'd come into to work in a hospital and we have this room that, you know, it's probably not much larger than, than the room that I'm giving this talk from. And every day there would be some huge donation uh, of, of something to the hospital. You know, you have like a Girl Scout troop donate, you know, thousands of handmade or origami hearts for everybody. We, we got 1,500 origami hearts that somebody made. I walk in one day and there's, you know, there's, you know, pallets of Girl Scout cookies or local restaurants who donate food uh, they brought me down one day and some local distributor donated, I think it was, it was either eight or nine pallets of Cheez-Its, <laughs> you, oh, you know, wow. I mean, you know <laughs> a stack, you know, seven feet tall, five feet wide, you know, I mean, uh, yeah. of Cheez-Its and, you know, or you walk in and somebody donates, you know, a thousand masks and, uh, you know, and, and so in the midst of all the suffering and all the unfortunateness. Uh, you know, there's really been a lot of good of, of people kind of working together to kind of support, uh, you know, the, the the humanitarian components of it. And that kind of really, uh, it, it really is very uh, heartwarming. Yeah. You, that you feel like there is some, some hope and faith in humanity. Absolutely. Now, I, I realize you've been very gener generous with your time, but I'd love to close on one final question, if that's okay. Uh, and that would be if you were talking to, let's just say, a group of med students who hadn't yet decided where they wanted to focus, what would be your, for lack of a better term, sales pitch to choose the heart or cardiac or cardiac thoracic uh, surgery? So, you know, and, and having mentored uh, some colleagues and students of all ages over I'm the sure. years, I think yeah. the most important thing is you really have to love it. Uh, you know, don't get into it because of you know, your, what you think may be money or fame or this right. or that. You really have to, it really needs to to fuel your your fire and feed your soul, you know, because it's 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 hard work. It's it's years, if not decades, of training. Every aspect of it is a struggle. I've got a wonderful junior partner that uh, you know I, I see how it's it's hard for her, uh, much like it was hard for me. And you know, and it, it it's a constant learning process, and you really have to love it to you know, to get out of bed in the middle of the night, to go see a patient, 
you know, the, the hours, the, the stress, uh, the scrutiny, everything that we do more so in cardiac surgery than anything else in medicine is, is scrutinized at the individual level. And, and, you know, so for a, you know, for a young student at any time, you know, if that's really what you want to do, then by all means, you got to dive in head first and embrace all of it. And if you have any reservations, it may not be the best thing for you and take the time during, you know, med school, take a gap year, take, uh, you know, opportunities of working with mentors to really see all that medicine has to offer. I mean, there is a lot of exciting areas that people get very little exposure to, uh, you know, throughout their training. Yeah. And, and I tell people sometimes it's not just a matter of finding out what you want to do, but also eliminating those things that you clearly don't want to do. Uh, because your life as, as a resident or as a student is completely different than what your life is, you know, when you're out in practice. Yeah. And so take the time and energy to really look around, open your eyes, talk to people, mentor people, you know, and, and see what they do and, and make sure it's really, really what you want. Absolutely. Well, I think we'll leave it there. Well, Michael, thank you so much for joining My us. My pleasure. And thank you. And, uh, you know, good luck to everybody and uh, stay safe and, you know, Thanks for the opportunity. It was fun. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you.